Okay, I think we're about ready to get started. So, um, sorry for the slight delay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, tonight I'm talking about episodic Cushing syndrome and salivary cortisol testing on your smartphones. And I will mute everybody's phones. Uh, please hit the chat button if you're if you if you are um, not muted, please mute your own phone. Thank you, everybody, for muting your phones and your computers. So states of glucocorticoid excess include ACTH dependent sites such as Cushing's disease, which is about 90 to 95 percent of ACTH dependent sites. States, and then you have a topic ACTH syndrome. You have Cushing's that's due to low ACTH states or ACTH independent sites. This includes adrenal adenoma and adrenal carcinoma. You have exogenous sources taking exogenous glucocorticoids, and you have what's called uh, pseudo Cushing's disorders, which are often psychological conditions that can raise your cortisol, including depression and alcoholism. You can also have pregnancy, which is a state of high cortisol. And you need to distinguish early or mild Cushing's from other diseases. Cushing's is considered rare, but it may not be so rare. And um, surveys of patients with conditions with, such as diabetes who are screened for Cushing's syndrome suggest it is likely undertreated and under, underdiagnosed. Some diseases that have signs that have things in common with Cushing's, in common with Cushing, include PCOS or metabolic syndrome. These are more, more um, common than during Cushing's disease, but the treatment is quite different for them. Thus, there needs to be a strategy to be developed to diagnose Cushing's syndrome. Oh, so okay, again, everybody, please mute your mute your phones or your computers. There are several conditions with normal cortisol levels, which may mimic Cushing's syndrome. However, one gives you rapid waking, stretch marks, trouble sleeping, fatigue, acne, and irregular period. So obviously, obesity is the most common condition, but it's not associated with very good monitor. There's what's called syndrome X, or metabolic syndrome, or also resistance. That can give you a little bit of these symptoms, but certainly not that many. There's polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can give you whiskey, regular periods, extra hair growth, but it's quite different from Cushing's disease. And you can also have other deficiency where you have some of these similar symptoms, but it's quite different. It can be tested. And I think the question I'd like to ask is do all diseases do progress from mild to severe? So you can have a linear pattern that you start off mild and you become more severe. You can have a delayed off with very little symptoms and all of a sudden you reach a threshold and you start developing more symptoms. You have a more rapid onset where you have the symptoms develop right away and then it's cut down. So I think Cushing's is probably going to be a little bit of either delayed onset or linear. Some people are rapid onset, but whatever it is, you want to try to catch it early. So the question is, should Cushing's be diagnosed early? I would say yes. Cushing's patients are miserable, and there is effective treatment such as surgery, and there's also effective medicine. So for me. I try to diagnose my patient with Cushing's early. So the question is, how do you do that? First of all, you look at a careful history and physical. You change, look for change in weight and body habitus. 
try to look at old pictures. And not everybody has early signs and symptoms, especially the early in the periodic patients that we'll talk about. The problem is most published data compare severe Cushing's with normal. And it's important to develop diagnose early before the devastating sequelae develop. The initial diagnosis is the most hardest part of Cushing's, telling what type of Cushing's it is, usually the treatments are hard, but not that as hard. So the first diagnosis is rather important. And there's a term called gestalt, which means to try to get as much information as possible. Um, and as we'll talk about today, episodic Cushing's is quite common. So one positive test may be worth more than 10 negative tests. Try to make the, the classic teaching is you make the diagnosis before the differential diagnosis, before determining what type of Cushing's it is. And, and I'm not sure I agree with that. So you, you, the old dogma used to be don't do imaging until you make the diagnosis. And I published a paper showing that imaging with pituitary MRI is one of the most important things to diagnose Cushing's disease. And I think most people are agreeing with me now. In 2008, the Anderson Society uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism a guide for the diagnosis of Cushing's syndrome. And they recommended uh, first line tests, urinary free cortisol, low dose or overnight dexamethasone suppression tests, and nighttime salivary cortisols. They also recommended that the testing for Cushing syndrome in patients with multiple and progressive features, uh, to test for Cushing syndrome in patients with multiple and progressive features compatible with Cushing's. And if there's an abnormal test, the patients can see an endocrinologist and undergo a second test, either one of the above, or sometimes a serum midnight cortisol or a dexamethasone CRH test. Uh, patients with two or more normal results should not undergo further evaluation. And this is an important thing for what we're talking about tonight. Recommend additional testing in patients with discordant results, meaning one test positive, one test negative. Normal results suspected of cyclical, cyclic hypercortisolism or initially normal responses that accumulate over time. So that's in 2008, the Anderson Society leaders did uh, recognize that cyclical Cushing does exist. They don't recommend further testing for, for Cushing syndrome in individuals with negative results, except in patients suspected of having a rare case of Cushing, of cyclical Cushing. So Anderson Society leaders still felt that Cushing's existed, but was rare. Um, again, this is taken from this article here. Rarely patients have been described with episodic secretion of cortisol excess in a cyclical pattern with peaks occurring at intervals of several days to many months. Because the dexamethasone suppression test may be normal in patients who are cycling out of hypercortisolism, these tests are not recommended for patients suspected of having cyclic disease. Instead, measurement of urinary free cortisol or salivary cortisol may, be, may best demonstrate cyclicity in patients for whom clinical suspicion is high, but initial tests are normal, fault is recommended with repeated testing if possible to coincide with clinical symptoms. So, um, you know, I, I'm glad the Anderson Society has, has recognized cyclical Cushing and they um, propose it in their guidelines. In this article here, they have an algorithm. I'll look over this in depth, but you can see that they recommend either 24-hour uh, for cortisol, overnight dexamethasone suppressed, or late-night salivary cortisol testing. Consider the caveat, any abnormal results, uh, consult any chronologist and do further tests. And if your tests are nor abnormal, Christian syndrome is likely. Now, just for terminology, I think most people, many people, including the Asian side, don't really understand this. Periodic or cyclical refers to changes in cortisol levels that occur on a regular, predictable basis. Episodic refers to high cortisol levels that are interspersed among normal or low cortisols, and most of my patients are what is called episodic. So I think episodic is the correct term. And we did publish our paper in 2010 on the prevalence, uh, high prevalence of normal tests assessing hypercortisolism in subjects with mild and episodic Christian syndrome um, suggests that the paradigm for diagnosis and exclusion of Christian syndrome requires multiple testing. It was published in Hormone and Metabolic Research in 2010. And in this paper, we found that 65 of the 66 patients with Christian syndrome that we studied consecutively had at least one normal test of cortisol, and most patients had several normal tests. And therefore, that if you, only, if you stopped at one test, you would have erroneously concluded the patient has, does not have Cushing's when actually they did. So if any of you have a doctor who says, I don't believe in cyclical Cushing's or episodic Cushing's, I think it's rare you should show them this paper. 
the probability of having Christian syndrome when one test was negative was quite high. It was 92% for 23-hour uh, 11 p.m. salivary cortisol, 88% for 24-hour urine free cortisol, 86% for 24-hour 17 hydroxy steroid, and 54% for nighttime plasma cortisol. These results demonstrate that episodic hypercortisolone is highly prevalent in subjects with mild Christian syndrome, and no single test was effective in, in conclusively diagnosing or excluding the condition. Rather, the paradigm for diagnosis should be a careful history and physical, and in most patients with whom Christian syndrome or disease is suspected, multiple tests assessing hypercortisolone should be performed on subsequent occasions, especially when the patient is experiencing signs and symptoms of short-term hypercortisolism. So the question is, how do you determine whether the patient is in a hypercortisolemic phase? Um, and our paper shows that most patients with recurrent Christian syndrome are episodic in one or more normal values. Um, the nor thus, one normal value does not exclude Cushing's. However, a series of normal values does make Cushing's unlikely at that current time. And I never say you don't have it. I always say at least at that current time, it should be tested. I usually like, as the Energy Society recommends, to see at least two separate high values for testing. Um, our conclusion is then that, you know, mo most patients are episodic to some degree. It's marked by mostly normal or low cortisol levels with some high values accounting for the signs and symptoms of Christian syndrome. It can be all types of Christian syndrome over my hands. It's mostly pituitary, and these cases are very difficult to diagnose and difficult to exclude. And um, I agree with the Anderson Society recommendations. I like to see two different high tests. The higher the test, the more likely Cushing's is. And patients with mild or episodic Cushing seem to have as many symptoms and as poor quality of life as those with full-blown uh, Cushing's. And this may be due to having lows during the day and highs at night. And, you know, some people um, in the Cushing's field say, yes, we think they have mild Cushing's, but we're not sure that they'll get better with surgery. So I'm not sure that's really evidence-based that I think these patients do have um, multiple, uh, poor, have poor quality of life and more, as many symptoms as somebody who's full blown. So my paradigm is to do multiple 11 p.m. salivary cortisols, you can do midnight cortisol, when symptoms, with symptoms of high cortisol. I do multiple 24-hour urine free cortisols and 17 hydroxy steroids, which is a cortisol metabolite. Um, I look at a 10-hour urine free cortisol creatinine ratio and use a cutout of 15, although this has not been published. Um, I do midnight serum cortisol with value greater than 7.5 is consistent with Cushing's. And overnight or low dose dexamethasone tests are not particularly helpful in patients with episodic Cushing's. Now, many people ask me about this cortisol binding globulin. Cortisol binding globulin is extremely important and it binds to cortisol. It raised, it's raised by oral estrogens or contraceptives. However, it's not changed in Cushing's. So, whether you have Cushing's or not, you can't just say this. CBG is higher or lower, and it's in general, it's, a, it's lower in the evening than in the morning, and this allows more free cortisol to, bound, to bind, to, uh, to be released. So only the free cortisol exerts symptoms. So if you have a high total, but your free is sort of low, is low you're not going to have any symptoms of Cushing's. And similarly, if your total is sort of low, but your free is high, then you will have the symptoms of Cushing's. And when the serum cortisol is approximately 20, is like a cutoff. It's lower in the evening when the cortisol binding globulin is lower. Cortisol is mainly bound to cortisol binding globulin, and therefore little free cortisol is present. But there's some always free. However, and this results in a little increase in salivary cortisol or urinary free cortisol. As the serum cortisol exceeds this cutoff greater than 20, the salivary cortisol will go up, the urinary free cortisol will rise dramatically. Uh, many of the people don't really understand that having a high CBG, it doesn't make it harder to get UF, high UFC or salivary cortisols. It just means that the, when you do the calculations, the, the, uh, the urinary free cortisol and the salivary cortisol is still high, but it's based on the free cortisol. So having a high salivary cortisol, I mean, having a high CBG doesn't make it any harder to get these high. Somebody's still not muted. Call in user number one.
Now, salivary cortisols have become somewhat of the test of choice in episodic Christians. It's convenient for patients because they can collect many samples easier. I try to have the patient collect when they have high symptoms. Um, I usually start with four 11 p.m. salivary cortisols. Patients can test anywhere between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. when they have symptoms of high cortisol. And these can complement urinary free cortisol for picking up mild cases. My approach is therefore sometimes to measure up to eight urinary free cortisol and some hydroxy series up to eight salivary cortisol in patients that are very concerned that have uh, periodic Christian uh, syndrome. Uh, you can also again do the midnight serum cortisol, 10 hour urinary free cortisol. I try to get my patients to keep a diary of symptoms to correlate with cortisol value. If they find out they're high when they have a certain symptom, then they go back and do more tests. Um, and if all the urines or salivary cortisols are normal, it makes active pushing unlikely at this time. A lot of people still are not muted. Uh, patients should be followed and re-examined at a future time. So the question is, am I in a high? And we wrote on my website, every uh, patient is unique in how their bodies respond to fluctuations in cortisol. A high period has some telltale signs for the patient. Um, however, you want to distinguish a high from a low. So some of the symptoms of lows are nauseousness, weight loss, depression, lethargy, extreme fatigue, and muscle and joint pain. In contrast, the high symptoms are, are wired at night, weight gain, acne, anxiety, um, mood swings, irritability, euphoria, more energy than normal, few aches and pains, acne easier, insomnia or inability to sleep or fall asleep, energy levels that perk up after sunset, speed talking, your mind is going faster than your body to process your thoughts to speak them. Water weight, uh, edema, high blood pressure, and if a patient has diabetes, um, high blood sugar. And we've all, often recommend that somebody check their blood sugars every night about two hours after dinner, and if there's a spike in their blood sugar, um, that would be a good time to test for a high. And as the uh, Beach Boy said, wouldn't it be nice to be able to test your cortisol to see if you're in a high and get results right back right away. Patients have asked me this for at least 10 years. I've been looking to try to see if a company has done this. Um, and it's a similar, to, it's called point of care testing. It's similar to, um, to what you do for blood glucose monitoring or home pregnancy tests, that you immediately get your results of your blood glucose on your um, um, glucometer or even now on your smartphone. And is um, what if you had the diagnostic results, resources of a clinical laboratory, and the expertise of a medical specialist right on your smartphone? Um, so there is a company called CALC, C-A-L-Q, that has come up with a salivary cortisol key for your smartphone. This was founded by Joel Ehrenkrantz, who I've been in touch with. He's the chief medical officer. He's an endocrinologist and director of diabetes and endocrinology at the Intermountain Medical Center in Murray, Murray Utah. And he patented him and his colleagues patented the uh, technology in 2011. You can also, they also, I guess, have a website or a sister company called peakbiometricresearch.com. And what their website says, there's a little picture of the um, adapter for your iPhone using nothing more than a smartphone with an app, a reader, a strip, and a salary sample. The system quickly and accurately measures and analyzes your blood level of cortisol, the hormone that surges in response to stress. And what uh, Dr. Eisenkrantz has stressed to me is this is not FDA approved for the diagnosis of Christian syndrome. Um, and he's very concerned that people are gonna start using this and then say, well, I got a high cortisol on my unapproved smartphone device and try to expect to go to surgery. This uses the AREP assay, and the AREP assay at nighttime at 11 o'clock at night goes up to 0.112 micrograms per deciliter. So if you're less than that, you're considered normal. If you're above that, you're considered cushion. 
I did not find the normal values for the morning, but the normal values are probably going to be about 0.6 or so. Um, this only works on an iPhone 6 or 6S, and uh, it's currently out of stock. Um, I'm not sure exactly when they're going to get it back, but they uh, did assure me that they're moving ahead with this, and um, they're quite excited about it. Um, there's, they also say they're going to have a reader for an iPhone 7, and an Android solution um, is also in progress. At least on their website, they sell an initial kit for $425 that includes 25 salary cortisol test strips and cortisol collectors. It does not include an iPhone. Um, it includes all these things to make sure the, uh, the kit testing works. So this comes out to, you know, about uh, $20 a, uh, a test, which is a lot cheaper than a lab. The refill kit comes out with 50 uh, uh, strips there for a collection. And their instructions are very clear on the website, and again, the owner wanted me to stress this, that this is a salary cortisol personal biometric machine. Um, it's used to monitor wellness and to assess, assess everyday normal variations in cortisol levels. It is not intended for use as a medical device to diagnose, detect, or treat diseases. They do have an instructional video on their web, on the PEAK website. You can go to peakbiometricresearch.com and select the FAQ tab, and the um, instructions for downloading the app are also there. Their instructions include refraining from eating, drinking, chewing, or smoking for at least 30 minutes before collecting a sample. Take the salivary to the mouth and chew to collect the salivary samples. Using the salivary kit collector and pipette, transfer the saliva onto the test strip and insert it into the reader. You wait while the app rapidly measures and graphs your cortisol levels, and you know as to what triggered an increase or decrease of desire directly on the app. There's a place you're writing in your um, response, and you can repeat when you want to see what your uh, cortisol levels are. So how do I expect to use this kit? Um, um, I think, again, this is going to, once it's um, you know, fully implemented, I think once our patients start using it, this is going to revolutionize how we diagnose episodic Cushing's syndrome. Um, I'm going to use it to, dissect, to, to detect a value of about, uh, about 0 0.112. If it's higher than that, then I'm going to suggest the patients use a LabCorp Quest salary kit and send it off to the lab, and then we'd like to see how well your, uh, the collections that you do on your, on your uh, salary kit compared to the lab for request one. Um, I will not count these as a you still need to get the official one from lab for request, but it certainly will give you guidance on when to send off your sample. Um, it can also, you also record your symptoms and then we'll see every night what your symptoms are compared to um, what these values are on this one that you um, do for $20, you know, $20 a shot. It can also be used to test in the morning for lows. You know, so again, you can test here every day and you come out to 0.6 or so. And if all of a sudden you drop down to 0.2 or something like that, that would be a good thing to say, uh, I'm in a low. Maybe I, you, you want to get a morning plasma cortisol or maybe you want to take a little more hydrocortisone, depending on your circumstances. And I really feel that this is a newly available product that our experience and, uh, you know, we have several patients on the call today and several people, you know, in Facebook groups. I think once uh, we start getting experience on this, it will help guide the company and help um, allow the company to submit to an FDA requirement to get it uh, used. So um, we're going to use uh, the chat button. We'll have some time for some chats. Uh, please use the chat button. Uh, you can email us after the, uh, um, by, uh, at mail at hormonehealth.com. You can go on my website. I'll try to update what I hear from this company. Um, and I will probably send out in my newsletter once I hear back from them that they're um, it's back in stock again. Um, and I'm happy to see you in my Los Angeles clinic to optimize your hormones if you want. Um, and we'll also post this webinar on a few days. So let's go to the uh, chatting. Okay, so Billy, the company's already sold out. Any idea when new ones will come in? 
Um, I don't think they're sold out. I, from what I understand, they're mar launching a TSH assay, and they will be using it quite um, hopefully soon. And I think, again, if we got a lot of interest from our group, I think that will encourage them. Um, Katrina asked, what about its use for adrenal insufficiency? I think that's going to also be a great use for adrenal insufficiency also. People are going to be able to measure cortisol in the morning and see if it drops below a certain cutoff. And again, we're looking at free cortisol here, not total. Um, and this could be used to guide people to take more or less cortisol or not taking cortisol at all and um, then uh, treat accordingly. Uh, Linda asked, thank you for your webinar. Can this device be used for people having low cortisol issues to better regulate? Yes, um, exactly. I feel at times under stress, I'm having low issues. This can be uh, tested um, and can be used to, to adjust accordingly. How has this accurately been tested? How accurate it is? Um, the uh, medical director said that he did uh, correlate this with, um, you know, commercial laboratories. It was very highly correlated. He did feel there's a little bit of uh, dependence on how you collect the cortisol, but I think our patients are smart. And I don't think there's any problem with that. Um, Can the reader be used to check if it is low and needs more high cortisone? Uh, yes and no. So if somebody has no adrenals, for example, um, you and you check this before you take your cortisol dosing, it's going to read zero. So it's not going to help you that much. You can test after, let's say an hour after, and let's say you normally go up to 0.6 or so after you, an hour after you take your um, hydrocortisone in the morning, and then one day you're under stress and it looks like you have a stomach ache, you're not absorbing things well. It looks like it, go, it only goes up to 0.3, you can say you need to take more. So it can help you if your ones that are low and needs more hydrocortisone, somebody's on ketoconazole, and all of a sudden they start feeling low, they can check back exactly in the morning. Uh, Katarina asked, so I'm reading it, so it's regarding like a blood sugar monitor used for diabetics, exactly. So, um, you know, you, you check your sugars and you, this will be similar. You're checking your cortisol and you use that to guide you on whether you should do further testing or take more hydrocortisone, again, once this gets more approved. Um, and I think also the, the difference, like, from what I understand, is you can, you, you get this, it's just on your computer, it's on your phone, and you can send me or somebody else the readings and um, we can sort of adjust, you know, see how it is. On many glucometers that's done, but not all of them. How could this be used in adrenal insufficiency? Addison's uh, general adrenal hypertension. The person already on prednisone since it was skew, even serum labs for someone taking food for it. Exactly. So presumably you're on if Addison's your cortisol is zero before it. However, you can try to see what it is after the after your your after you um, take your hydrocortisone and see how how it goes up. Um, Um, somebody on prednisone, which probably doesn't cross the actual assay, is probably not going to be that helpful, I would say. Um, again, you know, maybe somebody who's on prednisone might be on a little bit, making some hydrocortisone, some cortisol themselves, and it might be helpful to see how much you're making yourself. The results are immediate, yes, I think within about 10 minutes. Am um, I understanding correctly this device will tell your cortisol right away? Yes, correct. As the patient with, um, I guess, SAI, something, um, adrenal, secondary adrenal insufficiency. Do you first see this being helpful to use it at first? Yes. At first, getting an understanding of your medication, medicating circadian rhythm, and then to help with stress during illness. I think so. I think, again, you can sort of see throughout the day what your cortisol levels are, and if they drop too low, you can say maybe I need to take a little more hydrocortisone at a certain time of the day. What is the correlation with the difference between solid cortisol and serum cortisol in lay terms? So serum cortisol is total cortisol that includes what binds to cortisol binding globulin, but is not active. Solid cortisol represents what is active. So in a sense, solid cortisol is probably more accurate because it's what represents the, uh, the free cortisol. And again, I think this test is uh, quite accurate. 
would this be a good device to use if you're passing the stem test, but when you're under physical or mental stress, having low cortisol symptoms is a good way to check what your cortisol is doing? Yes, I think it would be excellent for that, and I think you could then see that you need, if you're, uh, if you're on hydrocortisone, you need more that day. Um, I don't think, um, you know, again, because it's not FDA approved, there's going to be, I don't think you can take it to a doctor and say, I need to go on hydrocortisone because of this. But, you know, I think, again, in the future, this is definitely the wave of the future. Other labs are, are going to be doing this. Um, and this is going to, I think this is going to advance the field. How could this test differentiate the last dose of hydrocortisone and prednisone from the person's own cortisol production will be skewed like the serum labs? So I think that's a good question also. So first of all, you can probably test it in the morning after withholding your hydrocortisone or prednisone for 24 hours and your cortisol is out of your system and you can see what your own body's making. You can go on dexamethasone and that can help you also as well. Um, Sierra says, do you think the price will go down any, any I don't, it might, you know, again, if they start making a whole bunch of these and people are buying them, it might go down, but it doesn't, you know, $20 a strip doesn't seem too bad. Do you know when they plan to move forward with the FDA approval? No, I don't. Um, you know, I think um, they want to get the strip with this. Um, I think they need to have some data. I was, when I talked to the medical director, he was going to try to do an IRB application to get, start getting the data, but that might be a while. Again, could everybody please mute your phones if you're not already? Tim, can you mute your phone? Sierra, can you mute your phone? Um, I think I'm muted. Will the user know what the cortisol levels are supposed to be? I don't know what the ideal numbers are. So again, for the evening one, for the night day one, for the diagnosis of Christians, it's uh, the point one one two is a cutoff. You're higher than that, you probably have Christians. If you're lower than that, you don't. I think for the other values, at least now, you sort of have to compare it to yourself. And again, I think as we get more experience in this, we'll have a little bit better idea of what is a normal value. But you know, if all of a sudden you're sort of at a point six in the morning and you drop to point three, then um, that you know that you're sort of in a low. How would what how would this person this prevent the person who needs to go to a lab as advertised? The person still needs to seek out a lab after a positive test on the device. How would this so you know eventually this will hopefully will get FDA approved. And um, then, then you'll be able to count this but right now. And, you know, this, I think in the next, you know, five years or something, this is going to become very popular. And then people will be able to use this um, as a diagnosis. Right now it's not. So you still have to go to a lab. Zilia says, I'm in the process of diagnosis for food-induced cushioning. Private labs show big spike post mice and got, got me an endocrine referral from my doctor for an test based on my private lab. My mother is also getting uh, tested. Have you noticed any familial links in the practice, cushion practice over the years? This will be such a useful tool to see if certain foods make it better or worse for time than if meals. So that's also a great question. So at the um, magic convention, I think two years ago in Chicago, I did talk about familial cushions, and I may talk about that in the uh, coming up webinars. Um, I'm pretty sure the slides are on my website. Um, the talk wasn't recorded, unfortunately. So I do have several families. I have, I would say, at least three families that more, two or more members have uh, Cushing's in it. So there obviously is something that's causing these people to get Cushing's and not somebody else. So definitely there are some, certainly genetic reasons for having Cushing's. Some of the genes have recently been identified. 
others have not. Um, but um, most people do not have uh, familial cushing. Um, but, you know, if you do, you should get diagnosed and then I would say get your family member diagnosed. It doesn't make sense to just do genetic testing randomly um, if, you have, if, if, uh, if you're not diagnosed. And then I think I agree with Celia that uh, this could be a great tool to see what foods trigger it. You can take your food and then test it, um, test it um, afterwards to see if your cortisol goes up. Uh, Linda asked a question. Do you mind if I ask a question about single cushion? If you have single cushion and had a cortisol stem test, what would that show as opposed to a 24-hour urine or saliva? So the cortisol stem test is used to test lows, not highs. And in general, it relies on being low for a sustained period of time. So somebody that's cycling between lows and highs, I don't think the cortisol stimulation or cortisol stem test will be terribly accurate. I think it might be better just to get a cortisol and maybe a salivary cortisol like from this kit, for example. You can also, again, do the salivary from the, maybe this kit and then go drive to a lab or something like that if you're in a low. The 24-hour urine is probably, and salivary is usually done for high cortisol testing. The salivary is done at night. Lisa asks, would a person, would a person with AI with serious symptoms treating crisis by withholding the doses as long as you recommend for doing this? We see many people have serious trouble even holding a morning dose lab. Once the person is diagnosed, wouldn't this be essentially the same with a day curve? So in persons with, you know, full-blown adrenal insufficiency, first of all, yeah, they probably get away. I've seen patients get be okay with taking their hydrocortisone in the morning and withholding it the next day. Although, you know, I don't do this particularly that much if I have somebody who already has adrenal insufficiency. If I don't think they have adrenal insufficiency and I think they're starting to make cortisol on their own, that's when I might do it. You could also give somebody dexamethasone, which doesn't cross-react with the assay to see if that is um, the cause of their... Um, if, if it, you know, the next, you give the next methadone, then you can see what the body's actually making. And in terms of a day cur curve, I think this is going to be, this could be a, like a, a day curve you could do at home that you could follow your salivary cortisol throughout the day and see, you know, when they go down and when they, when they don't go down and help adjust your dosing of, um, of uh, cortisol replacement. Uh, would this device be available in Canada, just the United States? They say on the website that it can be shipped anywhere and the world, and it could be charged a little bit more from shipping. Uh, Tim asked, uh, sorry, I'm getting late, will this work on only iPhones? Uh, right now, it could only work on iPhones, iPhone 6s, actually, um, but uh, they plan to use it on, um, on the Samsung phones and iPhone 7. Lisa asked, sorry, what I meant was that, that your talk said that if you have positive tests, on the device, then you need to go to the lab for a question for the testing. I'm mean, just not understanding how this is avoiding the lab, the lab trip as mentioned. So again, first of all, it's, it's salivary testing, so you don't need to go to a lab, you can just do it. But the salivary testing, you know, costs, I don't know, $150 a time, and it takes two weeks to get back. So if you're episodic, you want to try to figure out when you're in a high and send your, lab, your, your sample to lab for a request when you're in a high. So let's say you're in a high only one out of every five times, you can collect your samples all those times, but then you do this point of care testing to see that it's actually a high, and then you send that one off. So you still need to, you know, you should complement sending them into the lab. Does the salary need to be chilled or frozen? No, I think it's done at room temperature. I would say it probably should be frozen or, or refrigerated. Then you just spit into this little thing. It goes into the machine that's attached to your iPhone, and you get your results back. Linda asks, is it possible that a person could pass a stem test but still have adrenal insufficiency when under stress, surgery, flu? I'm wondering if you had this device and was having an episode of the device might be a good way to gauge if you're low and need to take cord tip on occasion. I think exactly that is. So I think, again, this cosentropin test works by having your adrenals not get a message from your pituitary for a period of time, you know, let's say a month or so. And um, then your adrenals do, don't respond to exogenous cosentropin. So somebody that either has very intermittent low cortisols, um, they would possibly pass a cosentropin. 
cosentrophin test. Um, in general, the, the cosentrophin test is sort of like a stress for people that do have a, a, a cortisol response that's normal to a cosentrophin test, they usually do okay with the stress. However, again, this is assuming that everybody every day is the same and people might not be that way. So this could find out if you're having an episode, might be a good day to take a cosentrophin test. It's, you know, get, I mean, get a morning cortisol done. I wouldn't do a cosentrophin test because that needs to be chronic. You have to have low chronic cortisol. Um, and, but again, if you're episodic and you test this low, you might, and you're already on cortisol, but you know, you take various amounts, this would be a good day to take more. Um, Celia says, awesome, thanks. Um, heard different stories. Um, I get it right there and I make the lab for. Uh, thank you so much for your hard work. Do you know of any other endocrinologists that will be receptive to this testing? I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, again, I just found out about this. The company, um, I've been in touch with the owner of the company who is an endocrinologist. Um, and I think, you know, he doesn't want this used um, for diagnosis right now until it gets FDA approval. He does want it um, to, um, you know, to use, people use it for stress testing. And again, I think as more people do it, then they, we will get more experience and, you know, I can share him some of the data and then he can try to get it FDA approved. Okay, Dr. Friedman, are you aware of this test for sodium potassium or is one to be done? I think so, yes. So I think this is gonna be done for almost, for most tests. I think everybody wants to find out the results right away. Um, you can look a little bit on those, these two websites, the iCalc and the, um, the other one. Peak, the peak. Um, the peak biometric research. They have some articles about other uses of these things. He's right now, again, he's in India um, doing TSH screening for um, point of care TSH screening. Linda asked, um, thanks, not on cortisol, but having symptoms of low and under stress, passing symptoms as well. Thanks for the time and sharing this information. Beth, thanks for your response. Other questions? Okay, I think we'll uh, call it a night. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. Okay, Melissa asked, how long is this lab for a we go to frozen? I think probably a year, probably at least. I don't know, I think, I think it's good for definitely. Bethany asked, do you feel there's much disparity between the testing on the app and the actual results? No, I think it's supposed to be, as long as you do it right, um, I think it's very accurate. Um, and that's what the owner of the company says, the, the correlations between the um, error test and the, what's on the thing, and they're very uh, good, co high correlation. Uh, does somebody ask that this might be useful for diabetes insipidus? Um, right now, again, this is used for cortisol, and for diabetes insipidus, you might want to get a sodium level, for example, and I think some things like that are going to come. Thank you, we appreciate you. Okay, so uh, we'll call it a night. Thank you guys for joining. And uh, I'll post this up on the website in a couple of days.